we have hit 1 p.m. Uh, let's get started. Kia ora everyone. Of course, I'll be talking well. My name is Sylvie. I'm my HR's Chief Evangelist. Uh, welcome back after the summer. It's the first webinar that we're doing, um, which kicks off kind of our marketing schedule for the year. Um, it's very hard to believe it's the 31st of January today. If you're anything like me, the summer break went far too quickly and February has come around uh, uh, quite quickly as it always does with the public holidays. So we're trying something a little bit different this year um, or with this particular webinar. We're going to be doing a Ask the Ex Expert session which should feel very much like an ask me anything so unlike our usual webinars I haven't prepped any material I don't have any slides to share with you um, there's nothing that I will be speaking to in terms of content um, so if you've been following us for a long time <laughs> this might feel a lot like the early webinars we did where it was myself where it was Jason Enor our co-CEO and co-founder um, speaking to an audience and, and just talking about a particular topic but in this case your questions will hopefully be the topic so if you've come along with a question that you'd like to ask Fantastic, jump into it now, start putting it into the Q&A function and I'll read them out as we go. Um, if you have an idea or a question that gets sparked by something someone else has asked, again, just pop it in the Q&A function and I'll answer them in, in chronological order. Of course, this is a webinar where we will be recording what we're talking about today. So if you have a question that you would like to ask anonymously, just hit that anonymous button to make sure that your details are taken off it. Um, or if it's something that you're uh, you're happy for your name to be put to, that's fine as well. Um, if your question does have any identifying details, I will just uh, scrub them or remove them as I go through just to make sure we're, we're taking care of everyone's privacy. After the webinar, the session will be available to you and to anyone else who you'd like to share it with uh, or anyone else who'd like to view it. We'll send you an email um, probably tomorrow and we'll also host it on YouTube and put it out on our socials as we normally do. We're also going to try something a little bit different today where we're going to be um, recording using an AI technology, the discussion that we have, which will take notes for us so that all of your questions will be gathered into a, a document at the end of it that I can edit and go back and clarify. And if I've misspoken or I need to add some detail, that'll be my chance to do so. And then we will send you a copy of the notes from this webinar so that you have them to refer back to. Normally, because the webinars are pretty focused around a slide deck and we do a recording of them, we don't send out any material around the discussion. That also just helps keep it um, a little bit more in the room for those people who, who are here today. Um, but today we're going to be trying something a little bit different. So while I um, have those questions come through, I will just make sure that that uh, recording tech is, is set up and working. That might take me a couple of seconds. We've had one question come through already, so thank you so much for putting your question in. Um, but keep them coming, drop a couple in, and then once I've made sure that that tech is working and set up, um, we'll kick off from there. So just bear with me for a moment. So that looks like it is all working so far, which is fantastic. So I will jump back in and make sure I'm answering your questions. So our first question today is from Luciana. Kia ora, Luciana. Thanks for joining us. Says, I am new to the company and I have been asked to upload the goals set up for 2024. I see previous ones in the individual folders, but I cannot find the, the same template to upload the new ones. Thanks. Luciana, that's a great question. Um, it looks like you're having some uh, difficulty navigating the performance review function, which is, is totally fine. Or, um, that's something that we've, we've recently launched and upgraded, so it, it's quite fresh. What I would suggest you do is go to the MyHR knowledge base, which you can access from the main website. There are several instructional videos and several step-by-step -step guides to access the software and, and to show you where to find those tools. Um, what I might do is if we have plenty of time in the session is towards the end, I can pull up a demo account and show you where that navigation might be helpful. But in the first instance, I would suggest that you go to our knowledge base. Um, in the second instance, give the team a call. They can talk you through it. They can log into your account and see what you're seeing. If you're calling from an, within New Zealand, that number is 0800 69 4769 between 9 a.m. and 5 p.m. And the team will be able to help you uh, navigate the platform and make sure that you're finding what you need to find. So thank you for your question. Heaps of tools available. And I will pop back in and do a demo towards the end if we, um, if we have time. Anonymous asks, we rolled out a COVID policy at the height of COVID and as a result lost a couple of employees. This policy is no longer valid. Do I suggest removing it entirely or replacing it with an updated version under the health and safety policy? That's an excellent question, Anonymous. Thank you for bringing it up. Um, we had 
probably between 20 and 40 or 25 and 40 percent of our clients roll out a COVID policy at the height of the pandemic. So you're absolutely not alone. Those policies typically involved conditions where if employees had COVID, they had to notify the business about it in a particular way, maybe provide evidence. And often there are requirements on those employees to be vaccinated in order to perform certain tasks, tasks or even to perform their entire role. Um, those mandates were struck down in several court cases as being unlawful in the majority of circumstances. So we've seen a pretty significant shift away from vaccination mandates in most industries, um, health and education kind of being a couple of the exceptions. Um, and most of those COVID policies, as you're experiencing, are no longer applicable. So to answer the question of whether it gets totally rolled back or whether it gets wrapped up in your health and safety policy, there's a couple of things to consider. If your COVID policy still has requirements that are sensible from a health and safety perspective, for example, don't come to work if you're sick, obviously. Uh, make sure that you're notifying your manager or, or your one-up if you do have COVID so that protection measures can be taken. That's all appropriate. So anything where it's more of a business as usual, here's how we would like you to conduct yourself if you're sick kind of vibe, that all can stay as part of a new health and safety policy or even just as part of your, your house rules or your code of conduct in terms of how you manage sickness. That's totally fine. Um, if your policy is on the more uh, severe end of the spectrum in terms of governing things like vaccinations, in terms of governing things like what happens if you don't get vaccinated and, and potentially what happens to your role, I would just repeal that policy entirely and either trust that your existing or your pre-COVID mechanisms for managing sickness like your handbook or like your um, code of conduct were sufficient. But if you liked the explicitness with which your COVID policy talked about managing sickness and managing absence, um, roll it into your new health and safety policy or roll it into your new um, handbook or house rules. And that way you'll get the, the benefit of the clarity around communicating around being sick while also removing any of the kind of um, punitive or more stringent measures that were associated with COVID. Um, Timothy says, I am new to my HR and I'm editing in the blue bubble if that's sent. I'm not 100% sure of that question, Tim. Sorry, that might be me misunderstanding. Um, when you're in the Ask Us bubble in your MyHR account and you're making comments in there, that sends a message to the HR team here. He'll pick it up within three business hours. Um, if it's a quick question, you'll get a response pretty instantly. If it's a request for documentation or for a process, like for a policy or for a letter for someone, then that falls into our standard two-day business, uh, two-day turnaround time um, for getting documents back to you. But if you're just you'll get a response back pretty quickly. The other thing that that Ask Us button can do is you can attach questions to processes or to requests. So if you have an employment agreement in place, you've made an offer to um, Susan, Susan's reviewing the employment agreement, she comes back and asks for, um, let's say you have um, a 10% commission structure and she would like a 12% commission structure and you agree to that, you can go into that little chat bubble, find the employment agreement request for Susan and just add a question to us asking for us to update the 10% to the 12%. So not only can you ask fresh questions of us, you can also use it to communicate with us on a particular document or a particular request that's in play at the moment. So I hope that helps. If I haven't answered your question, um, please ask another one and I'll, I'll get to you once I uh, drop down through the chronology. Uh, Timothy also says, also thanks to the team who have been very helpful in understanding to date, especially Tessa. Oh, thanks, Tim. Love that. I love compliments during the questions. Um, I'll pass it on to Tessa. She's uh, fabulous and has been um, a really effective, really clear-sighted uh, member of the team. She joined us last year, so I'll pass her compliments on um, and make sure she gets them. Thank you. Um, Anonymous asks, I'm very new to my HR. My performance review questions were preloaded by the company for most of my team. One, I clicked publish and now they're marked overdue. How do I change the due date? Uh, question two, one of my employees doesn't have the review preloaded. How do I load the same review as all the others? Oh, good question, Anonymous. Um, in terms of their uh, reviews being marked overdue, depending on whether you're in version one or version two of the performance review module. Version one was our um, our previous platform design that we had in place in version two we rolled out at the end of last year, at the end of October or the start of November. Um, at the top, there'll be some, there'll be um, a row of three dots you can click on to go in and change the dates. Um, and you, you should be able to do that as long as the review hasn't 
hasn't started to be assessed either by the employee or by the manager. Um, if that explanation is confusing, I do apologise. Um, you might want to go onto the My HR Knowledge Base. We've got quite a few instructions in the step-by-step -step little snips and little clips to show you how to change the dates on performance reviews. Um, you can access that from within your My HR account if you click on the Ask Us bubble at the bottom of the screen, it'll pop up with a link to the knowledge base. The other thing you can do, um, as I mentioned earlier, is give the team a call on 0800 69 4769 and they can walk you through it. Um, changing dates is pretty straightforward. We do it all the time. So whether it's something you figure out on your own with the knowledge base or whether you give us a call, um, we will be able to make that change for you and we can show you how to make that change in the future. Now, to your question around one of my employees doesn't have the review preloaded, how do I load the same review as others? Um, if the reviews for your employees who do, ha who do have this particular review have come off a performance review template, that's easy. You'll just be able to apply that template to the new employee who doesn't have them. But if the reviews for each of your employees were written manually, maybe someone had you know, a Word document open and they were copying across each of the goals, what you'll need to do is create a template based off one of your existing employees, then save that as a template and then apply it to, to your new employee. So again, you will be able to do it. It just depends on whether you start with a template or you start with the employee to create a template. Again, the knowledge base has instructions on how to do that. And um, if we have time at the end of the session, I will also wrap around and see if I can pull up a quick demo for you. Um, but give us a call and check out the knowledge base and we'll be able to get you sorted. Cool. Uh, Peter, kia ora Peter, thank you for joining us, asks, if a termination is being processed and the employee has only completed less than 12 months of employment, are they entitled to statutory holidays in the following week if the 8% calculation gives them enough hours to cover the days up to the day of their statutory holiday? Oh, that's an excellent question. I think the answer is no. And I and the reason I say that is the the as of the termination date, you must count forward any entitlement days, not leave accrual, but leave entitlement. And if that covers any public holidays, then yes, those must be paid out to the employee. But because this employee has less than 12 months employment, they only have leave accrual. They don't have leave entitlement yet. So the leave accrual doesn't get counted forward. It's still in payroll counted as, as the 8% loading. It's not counted as entitlement days. Um, I'm going to triple check that because I know there was a discussion in the office about it um, about a, a few weeks ago and, and there was some conversation there. So what I'll do is my immediate answer is, no, if it's just annual leave accrual, they're not entitled to the public holidays. But if it's annual leave entitlement, which it won't be because this person's been there less than 12 months, um, they, they would be entitled to those public holidays. But in your circumstances, um, the answer is no. I will triple check. And if there is any change to, to that advice, I'll make sure I capture it in the document that we send out at the end of the webinar. But great question. Thank you, Peter. That was a, that was a good one. Sean says, ah, oh, hey, Sean, how you doing? <laughs> nice to see you in this context. Um, Sean, Sean and I are friends, which is why I'm, I'm delighted to see a message of his. Uh, Sean here from Mushroom Material. We're going through our first hiring process and unsure on what's best practice. We have a candidate we really like, but I want to let our job ads run through the entire duration before offering the position. What is best practice for keeping said candidate engaged without promising anything? And once we've made a decision, what is best practice for references and or background checks for it, et cetera? Is that something I can do now whilst waiting for any last minute applications or would that be premature? Um, that's an excellent question and it's very much six of one, half a dozen of the other approach. Um, the, the risk of keeping a candidate kind of on the hook while you wait to see if something better comes along is that you risk losing the candidate, which is, is kind of the obvious risk. Um, however, the risk of jumping too soon is that you find someone who, you know, looks shiny now or maybe you think is, is as good as it's going to get and you risk missing out on a really excellent candidate later. So my recommendation to you would be that you start your pre-employment checks with this employee um, and you, you start going through the motions there. So assuming that you've um, had a look at their CV, you've had a look at their um, at, a, at a phone screen, maybe you've done an interview or a work sample with them and you can see that they would be a good fit, that's awesome. Um, at this point in time, what you can tell them is that they're your preferred candidate and that you'd like to start going through your pre-employment checks to kind of get to the final stages of the recruitment process. So this is when you want to um, double check their qualifications. So if they um, have university quals, you want to go to the university website, um, check that they did actually graduate with the, the BSc or the BCom that they said they did. Um, you also want to be running your, uh, your reference checks. If you do a social media scan, just make sure there's nothing 
too crazy or too illicit on social media. This is when you want to be doing that. And by telling the candidate that you are there, that they are your preferred candidate, you're clearly making signals that it has gone well and that you're interested in them as a, as a, as a potential. And you're running down the clock on how long it takes to get to the point where you'd be comfortable to make an offer. Because if it takes too long from application to offer stage, your candidate will drop out, right? They want to they want to find a job and have some security. So um, start start the clock on those pre-employment checks. I would also um, question or assess how long your job advertising period is for. So as a general rule of thumb, you want to be you want to have a job ad up for about two weeks. Um, in the first you know forty eight hours of posting is when you'll get the biggest boost from the seek or the trade me algorithms in terms of putting it in front of candidates, including it in, you know, jobs that match your search criteria, emails that go out to people who are looking. So that first week is where you'll get a lot of activity. Um, beyond about the two week mark, well, beyond about the three day mark, it really starts tailing off. And after about seven to 10 days, you that, that tail will still be dropping. So there isn't a lot of return on keeping a job ad open for four weeks as compared to keeping it open for two. And the longer that you keep it open, the more you risk those people who applied in the early stages dropping out and vanishing because they found other work or they found other opportunities. So anything longer than three weeks, I would say don't worry about it. If you've hit the three-week mark already for your job ad, I would I would cut that off. Um, if you're at kind of the six-day stage and you've found someone you really like, yeah, I would I would suggest keeping it up for at least one and a half to two weeks. Um, but anything beyond that, your return is going to be pretty minimal. So in terms of balancing keeping this candidate engaged versus, you know, how long do you wait to find someone else, that's what I would recommend. Um, having said that, you will have access to a trial period because all businesses have access to trial periods now. If you've found someone who's going to be a good fit and the business desperately needs them, um, at this point, I would take a punt and just hire them. I don't know that I would be super comfortable hanging out for a long time. Um, however, if there's someone who you feel like you would be settling for or someone who you're going, oh, there's kind of a key, a few key things missing, but you know, it's a pretty tight market. Maybe they're the best that we're going to get. At, at the moment, I would think waiting at least that two, maybe two and a half week mark to see if anyone else comes through. But there'll come a point where you've kind of trawled the market and seen who's in there and no one no one better is going to come through. Um, and potentially you might want to just jump on someone knowing that you could terminate them reasonably easily if you wanted to um, so that you don't kind of miss, risk, you don't risk missing out on them and missing out on someone later on. So that was quite a long answer, um, but I hope that was helpful. Annabelle, kia ora Annabelle, thank you for joining us, asks, does my HR have a code of conduct template that can be adapted for our business? Yeah, we sure do. We have a library of policy documents that we then tailor for each client that we work with. Um, if you'd like one, just email us. Uh, the email there is help, H-E-L-P, at myhr.works. So help at myhr.works, W-O-R-K-S, um, and we can drop a document back to you that's uh, got your brand and is, is tailored to your circumstances. And if you'd like further changes made it or there's something in there that uh, we have included that you don't like or that we haven't included that you would want, um, we can make those changes for you. So drop us an email, help at myhr.works, and we can get those documents to you. Cool, this is a, a long question from Rachel. Kia ora, Rachel, thanks for coming along, so give me two seconds. So Rachel asks, we are thinking about increasing the sick leave entitlement that can be accumulated to 40 days instead of the legislative 20 days. If we do this, should we make it effective from the next anniversary date? For example, if someone has 20 days entitlement outstanding and they get the next 10 days, then they'll have 30, or should we look to give back what staff have lost from previous entitlements? Um, I love this question. What a fantastic initiative. Um, well done. That's not something that's commonly that we're seeing a lot of at the moment. So the short answer is you can do whatever you like because it's a benefit above and beyond what the legislation says you must give your employees in terms of sick leave. You can manage it however is convenient or however you prefer. Um, what I will say is that it's unusual to, to retrospectively or to retroactively. What's the word I want there? to go backwards and look at what staff have lost out in terms of entitlement and then add it on. It would be much more common to, to look forward and say, hey, look, we're doing this cool new thing. As of everyone's next anniversary date, we'll increase the cap to 40 days, not 20. So if you're at 15 days and you're going to have 10 added on, rather than dropping that to five, we're going to let you keep the 10. So you'll go from 15 to 25. Um, that's Fantastic. It's very generous. I think your staff would be really pleased. Um, 
you could go backwards. That would be that would be extra generous because you're you're retroactively kind of uh, uh, bulking up people's leave dates. Um, I expect that would be expensive, and I don't think your staff would be expecting it. Um, whenever I rolled out new policies, if you're thinking around things like parental leave entitlement, so a, a business is now going to top up, you know, parental leave for the first 26 weeks to 80% of someone's salary rather than just having the government contributions, for example. Those policies have always been future dated because you, you kind of then run into the situation of employees who didn't get it a few months ago or a couple of years ago going, well, that's what I want, my, like what? Whereas if, if you just future dated it, it kind of takes care of that. You're drawing a, a, drawing a clear line in the sand and saying, Going forward, here is the benefit that we're going to be um, paying our employees and kind of anyone who falls into that catchment will, will take it up. So you can do whatever you want. You can manage it however you like. I would say it would be uncommon to go backwards. And I think just taking it as a clean slate from, from today or from the start of the financial year would be very generous and, and still a very cool thing to do. Uh, anonymous asks, I'm very new to HR. Regarding KiwiSaver, can employees ask for 6% instead of a 3% deduction? Um, great question. Thank you for joining us today. Um, employees, uh, your question might be about a couple of things, so I'll, I'll check and see which one you're asking about. So um, as employers, we must be making 3% contributions to our employees' KiwiSavers if they fit the criteria and they're enrolled. That's a part of our obligation as an employer. Employees can choose what their deduction rate is based on some preset numbers from the IRD. Off the top of my head, I think those the deductions they can choose to have made from their salary or their wages into their own KiwiSaver are 3%, 4%, 6%, 8%, or 10%, I think is the maximum. So as long as it's an option on the IRD form that the employee needs to sign to change the KiwiSaver rate, um, then yes, they'll be able to choose the 6% deduction. What you'll want to do is go to the IRD website and search for KiwiSaver form or KiwiSaver deduction form. Um, there's a particular form that comes up. It might be the KS10 or the KS12. Don't, I mean, don't do that as gospel, but it's a, it's a form that starts with KS and it's the employee deduction form and it's the form that they'll need to complete, um, choose their new deduction rate, sign it at the bottom and then hand it to your hand for you to hand to payroll to change the contribution um, and they'll be able to choose from some preset figures there and yes, I believe that 6% is one of those. Cool. Um, those were all the questions that have come through in 22 minutes. So well done us for being pretty <laughs> pretty effective in getting through those. Um, what I thought I would do is talk a little bit, if I need to, around some of the legislation changes that have come through at the end of the last year with the new government uh, taking power. So what I'll do is talk about the trial periods and the changes there very briefly and then jump back into any questions. Um, again, your questions are my priority. I'm here to answer um, any weird or wonderful questions that you have to the best of my ability. And again, um, some notes and some comments from those will be um, recorded and sent out to you as a document afterwards so that you've got a copy um, in, your, in your emails. So at the end of last year, the National Act, New Zealand First Government came into power. And one of the many changes that they have, uh, have made and are looking to make was to trial periods. So trial periods were introduced a number of years ago then that were available for everyone. Um, when the Labor and New Zealand First Government came into power in 2017, um, they changed the trial period laws to make it so that only businesses of fewer of 19 employees or fewer could use trial periods. So that went from everyone being able to use trial periods to just small businesses. And the argument there was that businesses of 20 employees or more should have the resources to manage poor performance in a way that didn't... Um, that wasn't perceived to disadvantage employees. Because of course, if you use a trial period, excuse me, as compared to a probation period, the employee is giving up their right to a personal grievance based on the, the, um, the reasons for their dismissal. They can take a PG for other reasons, of course, but just not for, for anything related to their determination of their employment. So at the end of the last year, National Act New Zealand first come into power again and they have reversed that change. So now businesses of all sizes, regardless of how many employees you have, can use trial periods again. What this is intended to do is to give businesses the confidence or the safety net to take a punt on someone who maybe they otherwise wouldn't hire. So maybe someone whose experience is 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 limited, and um, maybe someone who is coming in from a different industry, maybe someone who's had you know significant uh, gaps in their career or who's had a, a time out of the workforce for whatever reason. Um, so that's that's available that's available to businesses of all sizes. Um, it's controversial because the um, Treasury did a bunch of research, I think, 
18 months ago, maybe a year ago, which looked at hiring rates and employment across the Mōtu, across all of New Zealand. And they said that actually trial periods didn't have any significant impact on, on hiring patterns. So whether businesses did or didn't have trial periods, they were going to hire the same kind of person anyway. So the perceived benefits for um, employees who maybe you know needed someone to take a bit of a to take a bit of a gamble on them weren't there. People were getting hired in the same ways they were always getting hired. The trial period didn't appear to make much difference. Um, having said that, it is a tool that businesses are very comfortable with. Um, we've had trial periods for a long time now, so they're a tool most of us are, are pretty familiar with in terms of managing our, the parameters. So our trial periods are now back on. Um, I had someone ask me the other day if any of our clients are retaining probation periods. Um, and of the 400 105 businesses that we support who have more than 20 employees. Um, one has decided to retain probation periods and the others have all switched to using trial periods again. So make no mistake, trial periods are very popular. Um, they're very much a, a tool that appears to, to offer quite a lot of benefit to business. Um, and so if in your organisation you have been using probation periods um, for new starters, then trial periods um, are likely to be where you, where you end up again. Um, if you do have any questions around trial periods, we've got some material I can send you. Um, but also, of course, in this context, if you have particular questions that you would like asked, um, then you're very welcome to do so. And again, I'll, I'll do my best to answer them. Um, so Annabelle says, kia ora Annabelle, thank you again, you can ask as many questions as you want, this is your time. Um, my entire online training is great as other videos, but I would really benefit from a one-off face-to-face training. I'm flying to Auckland in Feb and wonder if this is something that we offer. Great question. I love that you love our material and, and would enjoy our one-on-one -on -one training, so thank you for asking. Um, where we do provide training and support are for managers of my employees of my HR clients who work with us. So if you if your organization or your business uses my HR, totally line us up, we can arrange for some support for you and certainly at least take a meeting with you and, and talk you through the system for some support. If you're not a my HR client, then we don't provide that one off kind of training or consulting support. We're very much a, a business that focuses on our on our client base and all of the training and, and activities we do, we, we keep within those. We don't do one off consulting. Um, but if you are a my HR client and would like to get in touch to see how we can be supportive, um, please let us know. Usually we can make something work. Um, even if it's a face-to-face -face half hour or hour session, then we can do that. Um, we can do that online if, need, if needs be. You don't have to be in Auckland. Um, we do also have a team in Christchurch and Taranaki. So we have offices kind of around the country. We are potentially looking at opening up a fourth office um, early. Well, it's this year now, so uh, mid this year. Um, but yeah, drop us an email if you get in touch with me directly, Annabelle. I'm Sylvie at MyHRWorks, S-Y-L-V-I-E at MyHR.Works, and uh, we can see if I get any some support there. Those were all the questions that came through. Um, I'll take another minute just to see if there's anything else that anyone would like to ask. Otherwise, I can uh, jump into a demo account and pull up um, that demonstration and talk you through the performance review module. So I'll leave it a minute and um, take a break very shortly. And then we, we can jump into a demo and see, see what's coming through. Question from Peter. Uh, do we have to specify in an employment agreement that employment is subject to a trial period? Yes, you absolutely do. So the law is very prescriptive and very particular around what has to be in place for in an employment agreement for a trial period to exist and to be valid. And there are four key criteria that need to be met. So the first is that it must be written into the employment agreement and it must say in black and white that this employment or your employment is subject to a trial period. Um, it must specify the number of days of the trial period. 90 is the max, 90 calendar days. You can have it be shorter. So if you only wanted it to be 60 days, you could, but most people opt for 90. Um, the employee cannot have worked for you before as an employee. They can have been engaged by your business as a temp or a contractor they can't have been an employee and the employee must have had fair and reasonable time to review the employment agreement to review the terms and conditions being offered to them before they accepted the job offer so just to recap it must be written into the employment agreement in a clause which says how long the clause is for the employee cannot have worked for you before as an employee and they must have had reasonable time to review the terms and conditions before they sign the employment agreement so 
Um, reasonable time is a stretchy definition that obviously depends on circumstance um, as a very, very bare minimum, we say two working days. So two working days means that if the employee gets the employment agreement at 10 a.m. on a Wednesday, they have at least until 10 a.m. on Friday to review the document. Um, if your employee is traveling or if they have a particular lawyer that they want to engage, but they can't see the lawyer for four working days, not two, that, that is a reasonable request for them to make to have more time to review the document. So fair and reasonable at a minimum two working days. Um, a week is kind of best practice, but that might be a little bit less or a little bit more depending on the employee's personal circumstances. Now, if the employee asks for a month to review the employment agreement, that's unreasonable. You can seek legal advice with, in a shorter time frame than four weeks. So four weeks is unreasonable, kind of anything up to maybe 10 working days. So two weeks, I would say, is reasonable, again, depending on circumstances, but certainly two days at a minimum. Um, the other criteria that I didn't mention just before is that they must sign the employment agreement before their first day of work. They cannot sign it on the day they start. So if they start work on a Monday, that means the employment agreement must be signed by both parties by Sunday, so the day before. So clause must be in the agreement which says how long it's for and, and is very explicit about that. Employee can't have worked for you before as an employee. Employee has fair and reasonable time to review the employment agreement and the agreement is signed no later than the day before, the day before their start date. Rachel asks, how long after returning to work after parental leave is the payment for annual leave worked out on the basis of annual average earnings? Oh, Rachel, this is one of my favorite topics. Thank you for bringing this up. So um, to set the scene for those of you who aren't super clear, when an employee uh, starts their parental leave, the entitlement, the annual leave accrual, which converts to entitlement on their next anniversary date, is ring-fenced at only being paid out at um, average annual earnings, not ordinary annual earnings. So let's say that someone goes on parental leave in January and they've been with the business you know, three or four years and their anniversary date is June. So they've gone on parental leave on June and then, uh, sorry, on, in January, and then on June is their next anniversary date. So that annual leave accrual, which has been building up, flips into annual leave entitlement. It converts to entitlement on their anniversary date. That chunk of leave has a special rule applied to it, which is that when the employee takes that entitlement, when they get back from annual leave, um, it's only paid out at their average annual earnings, not their the greater of an average or ordinary. What this is intended to do is that when this employee returns from parental leave in, say, January of the next year, let's say they've taken a year off, they've just had a year of no earnings, right? That year of parental leave, they didn't earn any money from their company. So they might have four weeks of annual leave entitlement sitting there, which, which clicked over in the previous June, but that annual leave entitlement is worth zero because their average earnings for the previous 12 months are zero. Now, if they take it after three months, it'll be worth 25% of what they normally earn because three months is 25% of a year. If they take it six months after returning from parental leave, it will be worth half of what it normally is because six months is half of a year. And if they take that annual leave after a year of being back at work, its value is now back up to what it would normally be and they'll be compensated as if, as if they had worked a full year, which they have. So the, the, the key date to be aware of is it's not the annual leave that they accrued before they went on parental leave, and it's not the annual leave that accrued while they were on parental leave. It's whatever amount of annual leave accrual flipped into entitlement for their first anniversary date following the start of their parental leave. So when they return from parental leave is irrelevant, it's the first entitlement date after they start parental leave, which this special rule applies to. Um, now, again, the policy intention was to say, well, you've just had a year away from work, um, or a year away from paid work, as um, parents would, would, would like to make clear, having a year for a baby is not a holiday, but you've had a year away from paid work. And so we want to discourage you from taking your annual leave in the year following your return to work because your employer has already had to accommodate your absence for a year. Your employer has already had to accommodate your absence from work for a period of time. So you can take annual leave, but the value of it is going to be diminishing, will have diminished. And the longer you wait before you take your annual leave, the higher the value because it accounts for more months of earnings since you came back from parental leave. Um, 
quite a lot of larger employers will disregard that rule. They'll just say, no, don't worry about it. We'll pay it out of the greater of average or ordinary. Regardless of that rule, we're going to be nicer than the legislation allows us to be. Um, but certainly in small and medium-sized organisations, it, it, it's hard to have someone out of work for six months or 12 months for any reasons. Um, and where they can uh, be quietly discouraging of people taking that leave, we, we tend to see that happen. Cool. Those were all the questions that we had come through. So what I will do very quickly is pull up um, a demo account and just show you through the, um, the MyHR Performance Review platform. Give me two seconds just to pull up, pull up my demo. Um, I didn't have um, a massive plan to, to do this, so uh, bear with me as I just get my logins all sorted. Oh, just logging in. All right, let me share the screen with you all. Oh, hopefully that's coming through. So I've logged into one of our demo accounts here, and this is our My Business page. So just for those of you who aren't super familiar with the platform, I'm here on the launch page, which is the first page you see when you log in. And at the top here, one of the gray tabs is my business. And I've clicked on that and I've now jumped through into this page. So once here, we then want to go to this tab here, which is reviews, and that will then bring us to this reviews page here. So scrolling down, we can see a couple of things. On the left-hand side, we can see a graph of our activity over time in terms of what people have been doing with the performance reviews, if they've been engaging and creating new ones or taking notes or, or putting in um, assessing assessing people's performance. And then on the right hand side, we can see how many of our staff have uh, reviews in place. So when I was answering a question earlier around reviews, um, I said that if you have some of your team have identical reviews and you want to replicate that, there are two places that that might come from. So if we go here into the template library, this will show us what templates we have in place for our staff that are not attached to a particular person. They're just a template review that we can apply to as many people as we like, as many times as we like. So if we go here to first year BDM and we click on this, we can see that there are some key performance indicators here. We can see that there are some skills and competencies and then a development plan. So if this is the review that the rest of your team have, all you want to do is scroll down and click on Start Performance Review. You then want to choose the person who, who you want to apply it to. Maybe that's Ashley Clare. Or if you want to apply it to an entire an, an entire department, you can do so. Just filter by department here on the left-hand side. And then once you've chosen everyone in the list or just chosen a couple of people, then you can click down here and come to Next and, and start the performance review. Now, if you don't have a review in place or a, a review template in place, you may need to copy one from one of your existing teams. So let's jump in and see how we can do that. So I'm going to click on reviews here at the top again. I'm going to scroll down and then I'm going to find the person whose review I want to duplicate. So let's go with Artie Jones. I'm just going to click on his name here. <clears throat> and we can see that his review is in cycle. And there are a couple of key uh, skills and competencies and some activity here to, to manage. So up the top here is this option with the three dots with more actions. And if I scroll down, I can see that one of these options is to save as template. So again, I'm going to find the person whose review I want. I'm going to double check that it's got all the content in it that I would like. And then at the top here, I'm going to click on these three dots. I'm going to go save as template. That'll open up this screen here. So I might call it Sylvie's template for Sylvie's team and 2024. Once I'm ready, I'm then going to click Save, and that will save that as a template. So if you don't have one, you can copy it from one of your existing team. Um, if you do have a template that you want to use, that's fine. You can apply that really quickly. Um, but this is the way to do it, either by copying an existing person or using a template that's already there. I'm going to jump back into that Q&A and just check that I answered the other one around performance reviews. Bear with me. Oh, changing the due date was on here as well. Perfect. 
So I want to change the due date for, for RT Jones. Up here in the right-hand side, I've got this more actions bubble again with the three dots. Um, when I want to change the date, I just want to go to Edit Review here and click on Edit. And then that pulls up the performance review with the options to change. So at the moment, the review cycle is from November 2023 to November 2024. I'm going to hit the blue button here to say Change. And I'm going to say that the cycle now ends on, let's bring it up six months, hey, let's bring it into May. I'm going to say Friday the 3rd of May. And then I'm going to hit the update button there to, to affect that change. So any edits you want to make, you just want to be clicking the, the more actions button and then dropping down and, and making that choice for yourself. Cool. So we're at 1.40 p.m. I think I'll do one more question that's come through and then we'll wrap up and I'll let everyone go back into their days. So Chloe, kia ora Chloe, thank you for joining us, says, I have a question regarding hiring temps. If I have a temp or if I hire a temp who's already worked at our site, the employee did not inform the temp agency he will soon be employed under us. The employee has now received pay from both organisations. How do you approach this? Well, that's a difficult one, Chloe. So if I understand correctly, you're, um, you have an employee who used to be a temp. Your employee has now been paid as an employee and they've also been paid as a temp by the agency. So there's two things that could have happened here. One is that the agency accessed your business for the temp's time, not realizing that the temp had been employed and your accounting team may have paid the temp agency, at which point you've, you've spent a salary on this employee and you've spent temp wages on them so that they've double dipped. So that would be an issue for your accounting team to raise with the temp agency to say, we were incorrectly invoiced, please repay us the money. Um, or the temp agency may have paid the employee by mistake and not yet have invoiced your business for the money, at which point that's a, that's an, a problem for the temp agency because your organisation is not out of pocket, but it would be courteous for you to email the temp agency and say, hey, this has happened. I just wanted to check that you're aware that we've now hired Jennifer. She works for us. She doesn't she doesn't work for the temp agency anymore. Um, if it's just an accident and something happened in the communication, then that might be all that you need to do. However, worst case scenario is that your employee has fraudulently filled out a timesheet and sent it to the temp agency, knowing that they would be paid for their 40 hours last week, as well as the 40 hours of wages that they earned as well, or however long they worked. So if there's been if there's been um misconduct or lying or fraud on behalf of what the employee has done, that might merit a disciplinary process. That's a pretty fundamental breach of trust and confidence. Your employee has potentially has knowingly double dipped by claiming wages as a temp and also claiming their earnings as their employee. Um, where we have managed situations like that before, we have gone to termination in some circumstances where we can with a certain amount of confidence say that on the balance of probabilities, this employee engaged in fraudulent behaviour. Um, however, sometimes it is just a bit of a cock up, right? Sometimes the temp agency claims and the accounting pays. Sometimes the temp agency pays and hasn't yet invoiced you. So if it's a genuine error, you can you can resolve that. Um, but I would suggest uh, talking to whoever the manager of that employee is and just checking to see what might have happened. Um, and if you have any suspicions or something doesn't feel quite right about what the story the employee is telling you. Um, you might want to you might want to dig into that a bit further. If you're a MyHR client, we can help you with that process. Um, give us a call again. That number is 0800 69 4769, or you can drop us a bubble, or um, you can get in touch with one of the team using the disciplinary request piece. So if there is anything worth, if there is anything to uncover there, again we can help you. If you do uncover anything and you want to either um, consider terminating that employee or you want to think about running a disciplinary potentially with a formal or final warning as the outcome, um, we're here to help. There's no extra charge for that. It's all a part of the service that we offer. So um, a slightly bum note to end on. I hope, Chloe, that it is a genuine mix-up and nothing um, fraudulent or mysterious is going on here, but if it is, then you know where to, you know where to find us. So thank you everyone for joining us um, for this session today. It's the first webinar of the year. We're all getting back into it um, and it's a different format. So I'd love to hear in either the questions and answers or in an email afterwards, if you'd like to get in touch, whether you enjoyed the loose format. Um, we certainly have plans coming up to do more of our typical webinar style where there's a topic and a presenter and we speak to the topic and take questions afterwards. Um, but if you enjoyed this kind of more informal engagement, tell us, we're, we're keen to do more of them if you are. Um, 
if it's been a nightmare and you hated it, <laughs> please tell us that as well so that we know not to do too many more of these. Um, but any feedback is super welcome. We always want to make sure that we feel accessible and helpful, um, whatever the topic or whatever the, whatever the format is. So I really appreciate your feedback. A couple of points to wrap up. Again, a recording of this will be made available. Uh, my software has been typing away in the background and taking notes. So all of your questions I will um, type out and have clear, concise answers to that you're welcome to refer back to later. And you will get an email probably tomorrow or the day afterwards with a link to the recording and a link to the document um, for you to use or access as you like. As always, thank you. We really appreciate your support and your attendance. I hope that it was a useful session. Um, send us your feedback. Uh, tell us what you liked or didn't like. Otherwise, keep an eye out for that email. And I very much look forward to seeing you at the next one. So, Kaki, and I hope you have a wonderful rest of your week and a wonderful weekend too.